Hey, welcome to History or Whatever with James Madden the Third. How well I remembered that terrible day when the blood stained the sand and the water, and how in that hell that they called Suvla Bay we were butchered like lambs at the slaughter. Johnny Turk, he was ready. He primed himself well. He showered us with bullets. He rained us with shells. And in five minutes flat, he'd blown us all to hell. Nearly blew us right back to Australia. But the band played waltzing Matilda as we stopped to bury our slain. And we buried ours, and the Turks buried theirs. And then it started all over again. So some of you may recognize those lyrics as uh, from a uh, Dubliner's tune called uh, Waltzing Matilda. Now, Waltzing Matilda is one of my favorite um, Dubliner's tunes because I'm kind of fascinated. I mean, if you've been following uh, history and whatever, as long as we've been going, you kind of understand by now, I'm sure, that I have a little bit of a thing for the First World War. And I'm not really sure what that is, and I think that it's probably around the same reason why I refuse to shop at Walmart or buy things from Amazon is because it's just, uh, they're not good to their people. And Gallipoli, you couldn't really get more of a shining example of absolute failure by leadership in the British Navy, particularly good old red-nosed, cigar-smoking, cognac-drinking Winston, M.F. and Churchill, right? Of course, because Gallipoli was basically to go through the Dardanelles, gain control of the Gallipoli Peninsula, crash through put pressure on Constantinople, and eventually knock the Turks out of the war. This is, of course, the First World War. Gallipoli uh, taking place uh, February 19th, 1915, is when the big battle started. This is a pretty complex subject, and I'm going to do my best to walk you through it as I saw it. And... So we've kind of already been through a couple of the things that I wanted to talk about. So what wh- what is the reason why they want to go through the Dardanelles? Well, they think that they can go up there and put pressure on Constantinople, right? And they can knock the Germans out of the war. They can also use those trade routes that open, and they can have better communications with Russia and, you know, supply routes and all that with Russia. And, uh, you know, also this is like a way to put an end to the stalemate that has begun to happen in uh, for the First World War where trench warfare has broken out and it's just a, a dogged standstill pretty much everywhere little being gained little being lost on either side and back and forth and Winston Churchill just really thought that this was going to be the way the only problem is it is it is absolutely lined with artillery and mines. So, you know, the plan is you take your big warships, your big gunships. Here's the weird thing. They only took really like one or two modern warships of the time, battleships. The rest were kind of like these old ships that the Navy really didn't care about. You know, and they certainly didn't want to give any of their top quality minesweepers to this little sideshow uh, of the war that's going to knock them out. Uh, and, and you know what the strange thing is, is there's very little consideration given to, let's say that the plan works. And that you actually smash through and you take Constant, you, you start putting pressure on Constantinople. Uh, how, how exactly do you plan to do that? They really never really took it that far. I mean, this plan was sort of doomed from the start. It's not like I'm spoiling anything. Most people know that Gallipoli was a bad time. 
so this is what happened. You got February 19th for eight hours. Those warships, the kind of old ones that they don't really care about, and just a couple of the, like a couple of the more uh, advanced destroyer war sh- warships are with them. It doesn't really matter though, because it, for eight hours they bombard the cannons that are, <laughs> and all the guns that are there aligned waiting for this fight uh they like destroy they they destroy like nothing nothing no ca- they don't destroy any cannons okay and then that's real bad <laughs> like you've you've already fired off you know thousands of shells and you're getting nothing one of the reasons they say that this happened was because they greatly overestimated the power of their guns and they greatly underestimated the abilities of the Turks to fight. Not only that, they're dealing with something like, you know, really terrible intelligence and, and a, a game plan that's just, like, stupid to begin with. It's easy for us to say stupid, and I even think that maybe there were people who thought it was stupid when it happened. Because they were working with a map that was from 1908, because, of course, we're in 1915, so it's a little outdated to begin with. The other thing is is that it's so large that you can't really use the map to discern what the terrain is like there. So you're working with faulty intelligence. Not only that, you have very limited planes. So what they had in this time is the the plan was is that they were going to send out these spotter planes, right? And they were going to come back and then drop messages out of their cockpit. Quite literally, there's no radios in this time. Dropping messages out of their cockpit to the guns so that they could reestablish their firing points and fire on the enemy where they need to be fired upon. Okay, this is ridiculous. You're going to drop a, a note out of a fucking airplane? Okay, I get that the technology has not come very far, but do you think that's going to work out for you? Really? Have you ever uh, held up a piece of paper in the wind? Okay, those planes, by the way, there was like one that managed to do something and the other one was shot down immediately. There was only like three. So that was totally uh, a botch right off the beginning. So, you know, your intelligence is bad. You can't scout. Because you you have inferior planes and messages and way to send. Because, you know, at this time it was handwritten note, carrier pigeon, or a phone line. A physical phone line. So, no go there. You're pretty much just screwed right off the bat if you have bad intelligence. And you can't discern the terrain. And you think that they're all... Uh, like, one of the big things on the side of the English and the Europeans was that they thought that the Turks were just going to kind of roll over and run away and that they couldn't fight. And this showed to be absolutely wrong. They put up an, a, a very dogged defense. Maybe that would be enough to deter you if you, like, strike at them for eight hours with, uh, against their guns and you just don't destroy anything. So you just wasted all that material. And then there's this other fleet They're all kind of the same fleet, but there's this group of, like, 21 trolleys and fishing vessels. These are civilian vessels, okay? And they kind of fitted them with some stuff where they could go out and uh, disarm some of these mines. Well, these people are civilians, and they're not in equipment that's supposed to be for taking care of these mines. So, not only that... They're like, the the motors on these boats are insufficient because they can only go about six knots and they're going upstream in the current, which pushes about four knots against them. So they're like barely crawling up there. And of, of the somewhat of 400 mines in this minefield that they're unable to reach, uh, two of them were, yeah, two. They managed to get two of the mines out of the 400 pretty good if you think about uh what who was to 
geez, you're like a, a hero if you're a civilian out there on a fishing boat disarming a mine. Like, you, you know, that's pretty incredible. But also, once again, like, what did they think was going to happen with that? They think, oh, jolly hell, this will work fine. Oh, great people. Well, what are you thinking? You had a little too much cognac that day, okay? So move ahead a little bit. They've been fighting this whole time. March 18th, the big attack. They decide to get together all of their warships and do one great big attack. And, okay, so they got one cannon for sure. There was a bunch of them that were disabled, like four. Here's the problem. It was at such a heavy loss to the British Navy. They lost three battleships, and they had three more that were disabled. A third of the ship was sunk or disabled. Run ashore to keep them from going to the bottom of the sea. So, and not to mention that they didn't even, uh, they didn't make it to those mines that were not disarmed because there's, there's no way that they could have disarmed them. So, you know, at this point, you might want to just say, hey, I think we shouldn't do this anymore. Like, we, we, have, we have lost so incredible, we've lost so many battleships. Like, when you lose a battleship, you're talking about years of building. You know, think of all the fuel and the munitions and the steel and, you know, all the time it takes to rivet all that stuff together, the engines, the you cannot afford to lose battleships. That's why when you sink one, like in Battleship, the game, yeah, it's a big deal to lose your assets. You know, you can't afford to lose your battleship. I mean, you, you run out of firepower. Not only that, they're just incredibly expensive, and they take forever to build. So if you commission new ones right now, they're going to be ready in a year or two. So this is, this is like devastating from the first couple months of the engagement that they're having with the Ottoman Turks. But they don't stop there. I mean, geez, why would you stop there? No, no. And you know, it's interesting because uh, the version of The Art of War by Sun Tzu that I have, it says that it was translated from Chinese in 1910. So, however, I don't think that the, the generals got a hold of the art of war, because if they did, they'd really have seen that they had made a bunch of mistakes already before they even went into launching this plan. I mean, I just kind of decided that I wanted to go into a little bit of the Sun Tzu, because had they studied Sun Tzu, I believe that they would have not... would have not engaged in this type of behavior um the one thing that that it does seem like both sides have going for them but more so the allied size is it's chapter one in the art of war it these are basically just maxims or quatrains you know he kind of lays out what it what you need to understand before you attack so this is like leaning, laying your plans to see what you're going to do. And the moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. So it's clear to me that in the First World War, the moral law was probably the most important thing. It was really the only thing that they relied on on both sides because of the mass amount of just throwing people into the grinder they did. Number two, heaven. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. Ask Napoleon if that one's important. Russia gets very cold, I hear. So number three, earth. Earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground, narrow passes, the chances of life and death. reading these because I think that they they set up kind of all of the the really bad decisions that were made here that result in the casualties. 
So that's number three, Earth. Number four, the commander. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. Number five, method and discipline. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of army in its proper subdivisions, the graduations of rank among officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. Those are principles that you just need. It doesn't matter what kind of warfare you're engaged in. It doesn't matter if it's land or sea or amphibious. This is just this is just how it's done. And Sun Tzu was telling us this thousands of years ago. You know, a couple thousand years ago or have you. I, it's the book on war. Most believe that the art of war was written between uh, 475 and 221 BCE. You know, it's been around a while. So this is chapter 3. It's called Attack by Stratagem. Hence to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking of the enemy's resistance without fighting. The highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans. The next best is prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field. The worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided. The preparation of mantles, movable shelters, and various implements of war will take up to three whole months, and the piling of mounds over against the walls will take three months more. So that really, you know, that kind of shows uh, the time period in which this was written in about walled cities. And there's another uh, section in here where it's kind of explained a little bit more in the next one, number four, tactical dispositions. If you're following along at home in, the, uh, in your own art of war, Sun Tzu said, The good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands, but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. Thus the good fighter is able to secure himself against defeat, but cannot make certain of defeating the enemy. Hence saying, one may know how to conquer without being able to do it. So, there you go. I mean, that kind of just really lays it out. These are the things that you have to consider when you're doing this kind of, you know, people's uh, lives are at risk here. And as a good general, you should be doing, you should be following these maxims. And I just, I wanted to lay those out because it's like, they didn't consider a damn bit of it. They didn't consider consider it at all. It's like, there was no, there really wasn't any deep thought concerning how this was going to play out. Or even after you've suffered incredible defeat after thinking that this was going to be great. It's just, it absolutely gets worse from here. Like, you can't, they were just, you can't cut their losses, you know? It's like you're, it's like they're gambling and they got to double down again to be like, let it ride, you know, for the big payoff in the end. Well, they continued to fight this war. There was or this, like, small battle sideshow to the Western Front uh, that was you know, being fought during this time. There was this guy who was put in charge of the assault forces, Ian Hamilton. Right, so now the army's involved because the Navy couldn't get it done, so they're bringing in guys to try to get it done. 
I don't know why when you just had you lost some you know a bunch of ships you think you're just going to be able to waltz in a whole bunch of dudes all right this is why I liked I wanted to do this subject is because it's it's kind of infuriating to me that they would just continue to do this even sort of being proven that it's a bad idea but they got this guy Ian Hamilton involved he's the commander uh, and he's kind of operating off of more bad intel. Uh, he's trying to get into the Gallipoli Peninsula. He's got to do. He's got to do it by commanding lots and lots of forces. And he's like using an old textbook from 1908 as well. So he's got an old 1908 uh, map. He's got an old 1908 textbook about the uh, about the Turkish. Uh, Yes, this is this is absolute garbage in my opinion. But you know, hey, I guess back then it might have been okay. It's better than nothing. Uh, here's the problem with this guy, Ian Hamilton. Hamilton is not what you would call a good officer. Now, apparently, you know, he had a pretty good record. This guy was raised on British nicety, and it's. Probably because he wanted his men to like him under his command. I don't know. I'm not a military guy. I'm just conjecturing here. But this guy really had problems as a commander. He he didn't really give very clear, concise orders. He would sort of ask questions of his commanders sometimes. So they wouldn't they wouldn't be told what to do. They were just like, hey, what do you think? And they just didn't respond because it's hard to get information back and forth but this was part of the problem here in Gallipoli just like I read the commander stands for the virtues of wisdom sincerity benevolence courage and strictness gotta be strict this guy didn't sound like he was very strict they make him sound like a capable officer but he is not a disciplinarian which you need to be if you're in control of uh you know a huge fleet like that of ships and soldiers. You know, he there was several blunders that happened when they first took men uh and ran them ashore. Like there was different landing points. There were several blunders that made the beginning of this expedition bad. Like and it could have worked a couple of times. We already I already said though. Like even if it did work, it was kind of like they weren't really sure what they were gonna do. Well, one of the things that happened was that they packed the ships wrong. So like all the cargo and stuff that all your men need when they go ashore, all their fighting equipment, food, whatever, all that stuff that they needed was somehow packed in the bottom of the holds, and they had to go. To, they had to take all these ships with all this equipment on them and hold off the attack for a month while they went to Alexandria where there was proper dock and equipment so that they could reload these ships. Well, I mean, the Turks knew they were there and they were about to start staging this big assault and there were places where they were not really that defended, but over that month, they were able to really... <laughs> really fortify the Dardanelles. I mean, that kind of thing is just, you know, you gave your enemy plenty of time to align their defenses. And they landed some troops. You know, there were different landing points that they were assigned. There was one that landed like a mile off where they were supposed to land. There was another uh, vessel that was like an old cargo ship. It was just an old cargo ship with 2,000 dudes on it. It was called uh, the V Beach. And they almost all died because they, where they went to and they thought that they would just pile out and everybody would just, they just cut them down just completely cut them down so the amphibious assault starts april 25th okay the british 
the 28,000 troops that are landing. The Anzacs, which are Australian and New Zealand troops, 31,000 are landing. You got 17,000 French. One of the big problems with this Hamilton guy is that he was pretty far from the battlefield and couldn't really see what was going on well enough. And that he, he actually even could see that there was an opportunity after these men landed that uh, they could have, you know, brought some more troops in over there because they had met very light opposition. And they could have brought more troops in. And the guy Hamilton asks his commander on the ground, hey, w would you would you like more troops? There are trawlers available. Instead of saying, hey, you, take these extra troops. I want you to go up there and snatch that high ground. Well, they didn't, you know, there was just like, they mulled around for a day. One of these land, at one of these beaches, they were up there in the places that they needed to secure the most. And then they, they were even there. They were there on the, on the top. And they walked away from it and went back to the cliffs. Uh, they, just, they just didn't have good command there. They didn't have anybody who knew what was going on. The terrain was, I guess, unfamiliar. So they had the high ground that you would have needed to win this battle, and they fucking walk away from it because they didn't know that, they were, that that's what they needed to do. Awful. Absolutely awful. You had the chance to win it, and you pissed it away. You didn't even know. You didn't even know that you had the high ground won. And because of poor leadership, uh, they didn't keep it. And of course, uh, you know, you just have more examples of this. And once you have all these troops on the ground, basically, uh, nobody... Nobody really gets anywhere. Didn't get far. There was some win in there, but most of it were like V Beach, where they landed that old cargo ship, and uh, the men started. There's 2,000 guys on this old cargo ship with holes cut in it, and as soon as they start to unload, they're all just decimated. Like, almost all of the 2,000 men that were on that ship were dead. There was a few survivors hiding in the holds or something. And immediately cut down. And what starts to happen? Well, everybody starts to dig in. There were men who got there and asked to be withdrawn, and they said, no, dig in. And they just continued to battle. For two months after that initial amphibious assault, they just continued to throw more and more and more troops into there. These were called the first, second, and third battles of Corinthia. I believe that's how you uh, pronounce that. And there was some advance, but mostly it was just a great loss of lives. And just thrown more into the grinder. You know, and uh, the British was stalled, and there was some efforts you know, made and held by the Anzacs, but still, it just didn't prove fruitful, fruitful at all. You know, it, the last major offensive came in, like, August, when Hamilton decided to try one more landing site, and this landing site of the Anzacs was called Souffle Bay. And this was awful. <laughs> you know, there was the Australian Light Horse Brigade that was involved in this, and they lost like three quarters of their force in a few minutes. Just, just dashed by machine gun fire by suicidal charges head first into it. 25,000 men came ashore at Suvla Bay and maybe gained some ground uh, 
at first, but once again, back into the stalemate. Back into the trench warfare that they were trying so hard to avoid. Back into the complete slog of death. Nothing. Nothing. So what is the toll here? What is the toll here? Fall by this time. And instead of being out in the burning heat, now you're freezing to death. And, you know, frostbite's a big problem. And they decide to evacuate. (laughs) Finally, they decide to evacuate, right? And the reason why they didn't want to evacuate is because they thought it would be epic casualties if we try to evacuate oh boy we couldn't possibly do that once again absolutely wrong absolutely wrong they were able to get out of there and uh their evacuation missions went really smoothly they went really quite well considering the other things that happened everything else was a disaster but getting out of there at least they were able to do that here's the estimates About 25,000 British, 10,000 French, 7,500 Australians, 2,500 New Zealanders were killed. So you had some 500,000 who were involved in these operations, and about 250,000 of them were casualties. For nothing. For a failed plan that failed in the beginning that failed in the middle, that failed in the last attack, and the only time they didn't fail was when they actually evacuated people. They did well done. So, of course, you know, Ian Hamilton was relieved of his command, and that was the end of his career as well, um, because he just, there was, like, not a time when he showed good commandership. Uh, Winston Churchill, by the way, uh, definitely removed from the Admiralty, and he tried to blame this on, like, uh, you know, hey, this wasn't my plan. The plan was this originally, but we could, but still, you know, they, they were like, oh, they're going to run out of ammo and all this. They had reasons why they should continue the attack, and they all turned out to be false. So this was a big smear on Churchill's record. And, uh, you know, he recovered, uh, obviously, when it came to fighting the Nazis, but my God. God, the the amazing amount of loss of life in this story is appalling, and it was appalling then, and it's appalling now, and I really don't understand how this could even happen, to be totally honest. How could this even happen? It doesn't matter what era you're in. You should not continue to throw good money after bad, which is what this appears to be. Just continuously throwing more good money after bad. More good living men after, uh, you know, something that's like a pie-in-the-sky kind of idea anyway. And you've just got so many that'll never come back. And to this day, they celebrate Anzac Day on April 25th. Which is pretty close to, you know, Armistice Day for us. But we were involved... But this was a day that, you know, the Australians and the New Zealanders took paid such a heavy price, and they were just off. They were just like marooned in these awful places. It's incredible that they survived, and that's why they still celebrate Anzac Day. I didn't do a great job of narrating this story from a very historical perspective, of course. I love telling everybody I'm a comedian. I don't have any reputation to defend. (laughs) I'm just here to point things out. And the reason why I wanted to point this out and bring this up, even though this isn't funny, it's just that this was a time when, you know, you have princes and dukes and you have people in power that are incompetent and the only reason they're there is because of their family. And a lot of these mistakes that were happening during this war were just because of that. 
I hope that people can just kind of look into it themselves and hopefully that before you take on anything, you do a little research and make sure that your intel's good. And if you have people around you that you need to help you with that, make sure that you've got them dialed in. It, it, it can be used in your own life, but it's just something that always sticks out to me, uh, this particular engagement, because of just how devastating it was and how the governments didn't give a shit at all. Could not care less about uh, all the people they were throwing into the grinder, Had did not think about changing their tactics, did not think about moving to a different point, did not think about putting those troops somewhere else, and this is what you end up with. Disaster. So they collected the cripples, the wounded, and the maimed. They shipped us back home to Australia. The legless, the armless, the blind, and insane. Those proud, wounded heroes of Suvla. And as our ship pulled into the circular quarry, I looked at the place where my legs used to be and thanked Christ there was nobody waiting for me to grieve and to mourn and to pity. And the band played Waltzing Matilda as they carried us down the gangway. But nobody cheered, they just stood there and stared, and they all turned their faces away. And now, every April, I sit on my porch, and I watch the parade pass before me. I see my old comrades, how proudly they march, reliving their dreams of past glory. I see the old men, all twisted and torn, the forgotten heroes of a forgotten war. And the young people ask me, what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question. And the band plays Waltzing Matilda. And the old men still answer the call. But year after year, their numbers get fewer. And someday, no one will march there at all. So... <laughs> <laughs> not that funny. <laughs> it's not that funny. I know. Not that funny. But relevant. Because, I mean, we're seeing that a lot of workers in the United States are just kind of being tossed into the grinder. We're seeing a lot of just negligence from our government in helping us. We're seeing so much that is negative coming out of just misuse of funds. And quite honestly, just dereliction of duty on many sides. So... Thank you for listening to me talk about Gallipoli. And I, I hope that I have maybe just opened the door for you to go and research this on your own. Because it, it, it's something that's important to me. And it's important to me because of all the fine people who were lost for absolutely nothing. And that's why I chose to quote from you the waltz, Waltzing Matilda. Which is an excellent song by the Dubliners. And I encourage you to go listen to that, too. Would you like to uh, tell me how I fucked up? Go ahead. Send me an email. jm3e.pod at gmail.com. jm3e.pod gmail.com. Send me an email. Because I'm pretty sure I uh, made a few errors. So, hey, let me know, and we'll get back to you. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. This is in history and whatever.